Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA card for tomorrow, uh, July 30th. And we've had many weeks in a row with MMA cards, which is just awesome. I mean, MMA is really one of my favorite, if not my favorite, DFS sport, and it's become that way over the last year. Um, had a pretty good week last week for those of you who followed along. And uh, this week, hopefully, to you know, continue to do well and, and help everybody improve their process and their, you know, way of analyzing these things. Um, so it's an interesting card in that there are two five round fights. And again, the five round fights are always the ones that need to be, you know, big decisions need to be made because in, until DraftKings comes up with dynamic pricing, um, allowing for the fact these are five round fights, these fights are almost always going to project to be extremely strong. Okay. Um, that doesn't mean you always have to play them. Right. But they always have to be real, you know, in consideration. There's just way too many opportunities for, for fantasy points to, you know, to discount them. And that's always the first decision you're going to have to make is do you need to, excuse me, is do you need to, uh, do you need to lock in the main event? Um, and and we'll, we'll get to that, but right off the bat, I mean, just remember, you have Nunez versus Pena and Moreno versus France, uh, Cara France, as, as the two five-round fights. And, and I'd like to say that the, the second one of those, the moreno Cara france fight, I think that's the one that is going to benefit the most um, from the five rounds, okay? Um, as we'll get to, I mean, I, th I think the Nunez-Pena fight probably rates the finish inside of three rounds anyway. So it doesn't, I don't know how much the fourth, fourth and fifth round are really going to, you know, improve the fantasy scores there, but it, look, it's not always going to finish in the first three rounds. So for those times that it doesn't, yes, those last two rounds are going to matter. I think the Moreno Kaikara France fight, seeing as that's probably about a pick them to, to finish. I mean, that's going to really benefit, you know, from those five rounds. Um, because both fighters are really good technical strikers and, and the more significant strikes that you can pile up, you know, in those last two rounds, and it's going to, it's going to, you know, incrementally really increase your, your projected fantasy score. Um, however, I will say that there are a lot of fights on this card with really strong inside the distance lines. Um, and whenever you have that, you have the possibility that you might not even need the main event or even the secondary main event if you want to, you know, hit the optimal here. Because I look, you get six fights that all, you know, score 100 points for the winner. Then maybe, just maybe, you don't need those, those, uh, those main event fights. I do feel as though there are several fights here are good, what I can, what I can uh, consider or call win condition fights meaning that if one fighter wins, that they are probably going to get uh, enough fantasy points to be in the optimal. Not to say that they're necessarily going to win, but if they win, um, that they're going to be in good shape. And I think those are really, that's a really key concept um, for, um, for DFS. You know, because DFS is not really like sports betting. DFS, okay, so sports betting is when, look, they, they set a line and you think that you kind of have an edge and you think the line is wrong. And so you kind of, you know, you kind of bet it, right? And, and that's a, a real important assumption that you're making in sports betting right off the bat is that, you know, a little something more than the public that you feel as though you some have some kind of edge over the line. But DFS, if played kind of in, in its pure form, is the exact opposite. You know, DFS... It, its initial presumption is that oops, this fight was beautiful. Its initial presumption is that the Vegas odds are efficient, and and you make your DFS uh, projections and assessments based on you know those those presumptions, right? Um, if if a guy has a certain percent chance to win, as implied by the odds, we're going to presume that. We're not going to presume that he's got a little better or worse. That's kind of more of a sports betting angle. Now, if you can combine both sports betting and um, uh, sports betting and DFS, then you're on to something. Like if you can actually have an edge in these money lines and in these inside the distance line, and then put you know DFS principles on top of that, then you're then you're really really good. Um, and I'm learning. I'm getting there. 
Okay, I think I'm pretty good with the DFS part, and slowly but surely over the course of the last year or so, I have developed. I, I think I'm, you know, I don't want to say I have an edge, but I think at least I think I have an edge in some parts of the sports betting part of DFS. So we're going to try to put those together and give you some opinions to go along with kind of those kind of that GTO, you know, efficient market hypothesis way of looking at MMA. But let's take a look. Uh, first fight of the night, uh, you have uh, Kosi versus Blood Diamond. And right off the bat, you'll see an inside the distance line, which is really, which is in, in really, really big. Fight doesn't go to a decision, decision minus 250. And that is a fight that you really want to target. Okay. Um, and I do see that Kosi is getting some degree of, of support here. Because look, he, he, he deservedly so. I mean, he he has all that wrestling upside, which is again something that we really want to see in in DFS. Okay, but I don't see a lot of support for the Blood Diamond side, and he's going to be pretty low owned. And if in fact Kosi cannot get this to the mat, and this does turn into kind of a, you know, kind of a kickboxing uh, situation. I do think that Blood Diamond does have some kind of sneaky KO upside here, you know, and at low ownership, I really feel as though um, that could be uh, kind of a sneaky way to get an edge over this field from a DFS perspective. So, um, yeah, I do. I do think this is a really key fight to target kind of right off the bat. And I am actually going to take, you know, some of the blood diamond side of the, uh, of this, uh, of this fight as well. So I would say, uh, Kosi, um, I don't want to say 50%, maybe a little more. I mean, I'll probably have two thirds of my exposure in this fight to Kosi, but I will put a third up to, um, to blood diamond. I think that's, uh, that's definitely worth it. So Poteria against Nikolai Negurimano, um, this again, fight doesn't go to decision line is extremely strong, minus 200. And what you have here is a case that, uh, that Nimigaranu, his win condition on the one hand is pretty strong. I mean, the idea is that if he's going to win, it's going to be because he can get takedowns. And that is usually really, really conducive to good DraftKings scoring. But I'm looking here and I'll also see that Polteria is a plus 250. Um, winning by TKO and at his price, that's more than reasonable, you know? So I think that both parts of this fight are, are really, really live. So I think right off the bat, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have some, uh, I'm going to have some action, you know, and, and if these, both these two first fights result in violence with some big fantasy scores, I'm going to be off to a good start here which is good because I'm probably not going to have much of an interest in this next fight. Uh, Jocelyn Edward, this is John uh, Kim fight. Doesn't go to decision line, extremely poor. Neither of these fighters have particularly good takedown upside. So I think that's a, probably a pass. So Michael Morales against Adam Fugit, big, big favorite on the slate. He's minus 600 minus 280. fight. Doesn't go to decision. Uh, Morales winning by in the distance himself is, well, plus 500 submission, minus 135 TKO. Um, let's see what we have here. Morales wins inside the distance, minus 190. Um, okay, that's good. Is that great? Um, I don't know. Is, is that gr great at 9,500? That's a really good question now, isn't it? I tend to think that this is something you probably want to go under the field on, okay? Because on a card like this with a lot of finishing upside, he's going to need, I mean, what's he going to need? 120? Which means, I mean, not, I don't even know if a first round finish even does it. You know, it's possible that he finishes him in the first round and scores 100. And that's not even going to be enough, you know, and, and he's not the type of guy that's going to get a hundred takedowns and ground and pound him for 130 points in a second round KO. So there's just very little room for error when you're playing Morales with respect to getting him in the optimal. 
Okay, and, that, and that's again the purpose of this video is talking more GPPs and how to win that that big that big prize. So I would I would actually put Morales as kind of I don't want to say a fade, but let's just say that I'll probably be under the field. And if I'm playing single entry, I'm probably not going to use him in my lineups. Okay, Drakkar close against Hafa Garcia. Um, you have an inside the distance prop, which is pretty poor. So on the close side, I'm probably not going to be interested. But Garcia is an interesting case because his path to victory is going to be if this fight can somehow get to the mat. Um, will it get to the mat? I don't know. But I think that embedded in this kind of money line is, is the idea that if he does win, it's because he got him in the mat. And if he does, then that's takedown upside, wrestling upside, and DraftKings scoring upside. So if you look at his price, you have Garcia at 7,100. I think that's more than, I mean, that's, I think it's a very legitimate punt here. I'm at plus 180. And remember, MMA, I mean, you need to find underdogs somewhere. And I think this is a very reasonable attempt. Um, so you have Blood Diamond, you have, well, the Morano at 7,800. I think that's pretty, really strong. What's Blood Diamond's price? 7,400? I think that's pretty reasonable, you know? Um, so Garcia, I think, again, I think is a very, very live underdog. It's a win condition play. I mean, do I think he's going to win? No. I mean, I think that he loses it probably 67% of the time, but the 33% of the time that he wins, he's going to probably score well because he's going to get those takedowns. So for me, I think he's a very live uh, underdog in the GPP slate. Okay. Dante Mays against Hamdi Abel Duab. All right. So, I, I, I have an opinion on this. All right. So, so I've been absorbing content uh, for the majority of the week here. And first of all, we're going to look at the inside the distance prop here. If it doesn't go to decision minus 185, which is pretty good. You have Mays winning by TKO plus 165, which is pretty good. I mean, it's okay. You have Abdulwab winning by TKO plus 330, which is, I mean, it's not that bad. But the thing is, this that that Hamdi is uh, is an Olympic wrestler, right? So, so his path to victory, I would presume, is going to be by taking this guy to the ground a bunch of times. And here's the thing that concerns me: is that I've watched content all week, and I've essentially seen 100% of touts describe how awful Hamdi's opponents have been, and um how the type of wrestling he's used to doesn't really translate well to the MMA, to, to the UFC. And I haven't found someone that really will take a stand on him. And yet he's only plus 150. I mean, they're treating this guy like he's plus, you know, 300. I mean, in this situation, I, I, I'm inclined to believe that there's something that people are missing here. So I'm, I'm going to take a shot that Hamdi is probably the correct play here. Because he's a, it's a pure win condition play. He ain't winning unless he gets a bunch of takedowns. And it looks as though he rates to win the fight about 40% of the time. So this looks good to me. So um, I'll probably play some Dontel Mays just for, for funsies. But I don't know. I have a feeling that Abdul Wab, whoever he is, is probably, probably the better idea. All right. Drew Dober against Rafael Alves. Here's another good one. So the fight doesn't go to decision line. First of all, it's pretty good, uh, minus 200. And you have Dober with a pretty decent TKO line, plus 140, okay? But Alves, his path to victory is going to be getting this fight to the ground, okay? And will he do that? Well, according to these odds, probably about 40% of the time. And at his price, which is a very cheap 7,200, um, every it's 7,200. Um, this, um, this is, um, this to me is a perfect, perfectly fine win condition, um, long shot. Okay. So I think Alves is very, very live. I think Dober's okay. Um, but at 9k, I mean, it's fine. But uh, he's really being priced like more like a minus 250. Um, I, I might get some of him, but I think Alves is actually kind of the better play here, which is 
And the more, the more I'm thinking about this, maybe I can get away with playing Morales here. If I, if I get a couple of these 7,200 guys home, um, maybe that's going to be good enough. All right, moving on. Uh, Semmelsberger, Morono. Um, I heard a really good uh, stylistic take on this fight that basically what Semmelsberger is uh, really good at is what Morono likes to make available. Um, don't want to really get too into it, but nonetheless, uh, let's just look at the numbers. Semmelsberger's a minus 150. Uh, fight doesn't go decision line. is actually kind of poor because these guys are both kind of strikers. So is his inside the distance line is plus 240. Uh, um, it's okay. But let's see at his price. And his price is pretty... I think it's pretty extensive. He's actually not 8,600 is fine. Morono, I don't like it all. Like Morono, it's not really, he's not really a, a wrestler. Um, he has some in the, some wrestling takedowns in the past, but not recently. And Semmelsberger fought off a pretty good wrestler in his last fight um, in uh, AJ Fletcher to get a kind of a well, you know, really tough victory. So I guess if I had to pick someone, it would be Semmelsberger. But with that inside the distance line, I mean, it's fine, but it's not going to be a priority play. So you have Ankalaya versus Smith. You have Ankalaya is, is a minus 600. Um, the fight doesn't go to decision is a pick em, right? So here, here's the problem. So Ankalaya has been getting this reputation for doing just enough to get it done. Kind of you were screwing around or just, you know, trying to keep the fight at range or whatever it is. And um, the thing is, is that in this particular fight, if he wanted to, he probably could take do it uh, under uh, undertake a takedown route, which even if he doesn't get a finish, is going to result in a, probably a lot of fantasy points. Um, but we're not exactly sure he's going to do this, so I kind of re regard Ankalaya in the same um, the same boat as as maybe uh, Morales. They're both huge favorites. They both are probably going to win, but I'm just not sure that. These numbers support, you know, a price tag of 9,500, you know? So I'm probably inclined to, I don't know, may, maybe go under on these guys. Um, uh, that's the way I'm looking at it. Um, I mean, as far as Anthony Smith goes, I have to say there, there's, one, there's one little narrative here that it's going to get 10% of my action. It's probably a bad idea, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, the one time that Ankalev lost, he got triangle choked uh, by Paul Craig. And Anthony Smith really has good triangle chokes. And at 6,800, uh, that's good enough for me. <laughs> so I will, uh, I'll probably take a shot at some Anthony Smith just for, just for funsies at 10%, maybe a 10% exposure. Um, but I don't expect him to win, obviously, but uh, just in case. So Pantoja against Perez, you have Pantoja is a minus, about a minus 200. Fight doesn't go to decision is kind of poor though, you know? And, and the problem is I've heard a lot of love for Pantoja in this spot here. You have Perez coming off a layoff and, and, and all this stuff, but th that's not really being reflected in the line here. I mean, minus 180 seems reasonable, I guess, but as far as GPPs go, it just doesn't look like like the underlying numbers support a good GPP play. Like he has a poor inside the distance line. He, what is it? Win by TKO plus 450. Uh, Perez, see, Pantoja inside the distance plus 180. I mean, I'll try that if he's like 8,200, right? But his price is, what is Pantoja? He's 8,700. I'm kind of inclined to be below the field on him and essentially below the field on this whole fight. Um, that would be my, 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 uh, my take. Okay. Uh, next you have Sergey Pavlovitz against Derek Lewis, uh, two heavyweights. I'm um, going to slant, uh, stand in the middle and probably just go after each other. You have an inside the distance prop of minus 600. Uh, I don't think you should uh, overthink this. I think you should play both sides of this fight. 
Uh, I will have a full 100% exposure to this. I think whoever wins this wins in the first round. And if you win in the first round, you, you're going to score in this bout prop plus a knockdown, maybe plus whatever you'll get a hundred and it hit their prices, 8,200, 8K. You're just going to have to have this. So I'm not overthinking this one. I'm going to play both sides. I've heard good takes for both sides, but this to me is the easiest thing to do is to play this. And then you have these two main events, you know, you have Moreno against Kai Kara France. And I mean, I have to say, I think, all four betting interests are live in these two, in these last two fights. I mean, you have Moreno who is a minus 200 and he's been more of the guy that's been in the, in the spotlight. I mean, he's been fighting some, some main event fights. I'll pull it up, pause this for a second. So Moreno has been playing, you know, he's been in the spotlight or whatever it is. He's put out some good, good performances. And Kai Kara France has been kind of like fighting a little bit lower level but he's been kind of improving and getting the job done a little bit. I do have a feeling that Moreno is going to get a little bit more love than maybe he deserves. And maybe Kai Kara France is going to be a little bit under, underappreciated here. Nonetheless, uh, this being a five round fight uh, where it does rate to go to decision. I, I, I think I want to have this, you know, you, you're going to pick up all kinds of significant strikes throughout the course of the, of the rounds. Moreno does have some possibility of getting takedowns, which certainly helps. Um, so I'm probably going to try to get both sides of this fight. I don't have really an opinion either way, but do not sleep on the Kai Kara France side of this. He does have KO upside, and uh, I think he is on the improve. And then in the last fight, you have Nunez versus Pena, and I'm not going to overthink this either. You have uh, Nunez who, you know, look, forget about the last fight for a second. Remember, like, she, she was a minus 1 million against Pena and Pena just blasted her after almost getting knocked out herself. I'm just going to presume that this line is correct. You know, and, and, and Nunez is a minus 270. Uh, Pena is a plus 225. Um, you have a fight doesn't go to decision, a minus 250. You have Nunez about a pick him to win by TKO, which is really strong. Um, and, you know, if, listen, if you believe that Pena is going to win, I wouldn't bet this fight. Just go ahead and bet this prop. Pena win by TKO or submission. I mean, this is amazing. You know, I don't think Pena is ever going to win a decision here. Right. So for me, um, probably end up at both sides. You know, I have really no opinion here. I think the odds are fair. And as usual, because it's a five round fight, I think that, you know, it's probably underpriced. But as I said, in the, in the intro of the show, I don't think that this fight is impacted as much by the five rounds as say the Moreno Kai Kara France, right? The Moreno Kai Kara France, I might not, you know, use that much for three rounds, but in five rounds, I kind of have to. I think Nunez Pena, these guys would probably, these women would probably project the same, whether it would be three rounds or five rounds. So um, obviously that's not exactly true because you have that cushion of having those extra two rounds. So um, so in general, I think that the, the Lewis Pavlovich fight is kind of a must play. And then I'm really going to load up on these first two, these first bunch, the Koski Diamond, Nimograno, um, what you call it, Pateria, and hope I get some action out of those. Maybe one of these underdogs comes in, Hamdi or Kaf or, or Garcia. Um, and I will have some of these two big favorites, Morales and Ankalaev. I mean, if those underdogs come in, that's really all you need. But these are really my main ones. I'll play the main event. I'll play the Moreno France. I'll play the Derek Lewis Pavlovich fight and probably get you know, a bunch of those first two fights. All right, that'll do it. Good luck, everybody. And uh, as Brody would say, let's get it.